This episode of Fermented Adventure the Podcast features Widow's Peak Distilling Company in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We had a fabulous time sitting down with Josh Douglas and talking about this young distillery and the amazing spirits that they're producing. Do reach out to Josh and Widow's Peak and let them know what you thought about the podcast. Cheers! Hello ladies and gentlemen, craft spirit enthusiasts, and those interested in the intoxicating world of craft distilleries, cideries, meaderies, wineries, and the occasional foray into breweries. It's Rich Shane and welcome to Fermented Adventure, the podcast, where we bring you the fascinating people that are making the mash, fermenting, distilling, bottling, pouring, and delivering to you some of the finest libations in the world. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. Thank you for bringing the podcast into wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We truly are grateful that you've chosen to listen and make us part of your day. It would mean the world to us if you left a five-star review. This helps us climb in the rankings and it makes it easier for others to find us. Don't hesitate to leave us your comments as well. If the podcast didn't meet your expectations, tell us why. We're always striving to improve. You can find us at fermentedadventure.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Fermented Adventure. Email us at fermentedadventure at gmail.com. All right, F.A. Nation, let's meet our guests. He's Josh Douglas. I'm Rich Shane. Dawn Ranieri's here. And this is Fermented Adventure, the podcast. And we are Widow's Peak Distilling Company in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Josh, I'm excited. We're in Ambler, Pennsylvania, and... I don't think... Was there ever a distillery located in Ambler, Pennsylvania? No, I do not believe so. So you are the first distributing spirits and alcohol other than beer and anything else that goes on here in Ambler. How did Widow's Peak Distilling Company get started? Yes, sir. Yeah, we uh, we heard Ambler's siren call of uh, need a distillery and we came running. So... The story goes, um, legend has it, <laughs> is uh, it's our two owners, Mike and Mark Ilk. They grew up around the King of Prussia area. Um, Mark is a, uh, he's a professor of engineering at Drexel. He works for the federal government, and he has his um, PhD, and I believe um, bachelor's in science in mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So he's kind of our mad scientist and distiller. And then his brother who is uh, Mike Ilg. He's a developer around Ambler, um, big, big community guy. And so they just came together. You know, the story goes, they were skiing with their families and then um, they came in for a cocktail and then they devised a plan. And they, uh, Mike really wanted to, he found a need in Ambler for a before and after dinner cocktail spot. Uh, there weren't many around, and you know there are three very great breweries here in Ambler, and um, so we decided that again there's not a distillery, and so Mark, our uh, our mad scientist distiller, had brewed beer in his basement for about 15 years, and so Mike came to him and he said, "Hey, um, I know you brew beer. Think you can distill vodka?" And so a couple weeks later, just like any normal person, he comes back to Mike and he's like, hey, yeah, I read a book and I think I can do it. I read a book and I can do it. And yeah. here it is. And just like, <laughs> you know, everyone can do that, apparently. <laughs> what year are we talking about now? Talk about when the distillery was started, the location here on Main Street in Ambler. Talk about the timeline. Yeah. So it has been four years in the planning. So I believe either 2019... 2018, uh, the plan arose, and then around two years ago is when um, you know we bought the building that our tasting room is in now, and the distilling started happening. So we're talking right now during COVID in 2021, where distillation started taking place. If I kind of did all the math correctly mm-hmm. that you described, yes, sir. Talk about Widow's Peak and how did the name come about? Yeah, so um, originally. We were Ambler Distillery. Um, We love Ambler. Again, we're located right downtown Ambler. Uh, And that just didn't have a nice ring to it. And so they reassessed and they reached out to someone online, sent a few pictures of the brothers, and they came back with the uh, name Widow's Peak Distilling. Uh, If you can't tell, 
Uh, I myself have a pretty big widow's peak, as well as um, our two owners. Uh, very beautiful widow's peaks, I might add. But <laughs> So that's where the name came from. See, my connection was going to be, you mentioned skiing, and maybe there was a widow's peak ski slope or some sort of run that was called widow's peak. Now I better understand yeah. how that all comes about. Or receding hairlines. <laughs> now, your involvement with Widow's Peak Distilling Company, you had mentioned prior as we were preparing for the podcast, you talked about some craft brewing interests that you had and uh, some things, the, the, the brewing scene that you were involved in. Talk about your introduction to where you are today and some of your roles that you play here. So I, I worked several jobs in marketing uh, before this, and I had a passion for craft beer my brother introduced it to me um, when I was 21, of course, and you know that just grew. Um, I love you know going to different craft breweries, uh, and I had never really ventured too much into craft spirits. But I live two blocks from the tasting room, and when I saw that they, uh, I was walking my dog by, and I saw a QR code up front out of the, the boarded up window, and it just said "scan me," and when I scanned it. You know, I was so excited to find out that there's a distillery coming to Ambler. And so a few months after that goes by, this was, I would say, back in December um, uh, or back in May, I believe, uh, I saw that they were hiring. And so I reached out uh, and then they welcomed me on board. And so I started as a uh, bartender. Uh, we're lots of different hats here. Um, you know, bartender, I'll be, I'll be cleaning the floors. I'm our, uh, brand manager, sales rep, uh, you know, it's kind of do it all. <laughs> are there any specific styles of beer that stand out to you? Are you an IPA guy? Are you an ale guy, a lager guy? Yeah. All of the above guy? I would say, I would say all of the above. You know, if you give me a, you know, pork roll beer, pork roll stout, I'll happily drink that. Um, you but- know, there is somebody that makes a Scrapple vodka or had really? been making a Scrapple <laughs> vodka. That was painted stave down in Delaware. I don't know how often they run that. But huh. uh, last time Dawn and I were down there, they didn't have that on their uh, their list. So, you know, you, you you laugh about a pork roll beer. You know, we're not yeah, that far off. Far people off. will people will do that stuff. Yeah. As long as they call it pork roll. Yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe you'll do that here at Widow's Peak. Who, who knows? You know, the possibilities are endless. But I'm going to say I'm not going to promise anything. <laughs> now, with what you're doing in Ambler, talk to us and talk to the listener about you know how you received an Ambler and what the experience has been like opening a distillery and this wonderful cocktail bar that you have here. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. We've been we opened our doors around six months ago, July 21st. Um, before then, you know, we didn't have much on social media. We didn't have much of a, uh, you know, marketing presence. So that kind of was good, I guess, because people, you know, were intrigued by the secrecy. And we we're like, no, you know, it's not the secrecy. It's just lack thereof, I would say. Um, so, again, we've been open six months now. And, you know, it's just a really great community. I live, I live right downtown. Um, you know, I, this, this is really, uh, I'd say what I'm really passionate about. Um, we partner with a local Italian restaurant right up the street called Sorrentino's Pasta Provisions. And so they, we, we're not, we're not, we're not, we don't have a kitchen. We have small plates here just to enjoy your cocktails with. So we have like focaccia bread with whipped ricotta, a deconstructed cannoli. It's like cannoli chip with espresso cannoli filling and a cheese board. And we'll be expanding those options, but we partner with them. Um, and then we also, you know, we like working with local, uh, businesses. So we get our honey that we use to make all in all of our, uh, cocktails, our honey syrup. We get that from, uh, Carajo Beef, Beef, Beef Farm. Uh, the, one of the owners of that is actually a bartender at Forest in Maine, Greg, and he's a great guy. So, you know, we really wanted to support local as much as possible. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just a great community. You mentioned your honey. Share what goes into creating your cocktail menu. Is it just you? Do you have some other bartenders? Is there a uh, contest? Is you guys all come together with ideas for creating your cocktail menu? Yeah. So we started off by our owners, uh, Mike and Mark, and our vice president, Lisa. They uh, found a cocktail consultant. Uh, 
extremely talented Michelle Cudia, um, Cudia Consulting. <laughs> um, she previously was a bartender at Philadelphia Distilling. And then uh, they're good friends of ours, and yeah. they've been a guest on the podcast. We really? love Blue Coat Gin and uh, all the varieties of what they're making too. So yeah, great, yeah. great distillery, really paved a lot of ways. Um, and so yeah, Michelle Cudia, she uh, just kind of helps open up bars, she helps design menus, train employees, and so you know before working at Widow's Peak, I had um, you know bartended at brewery before. I hadn't had much service experience myself. And so she just kind of taught me everything I knew. And now I love cocktails. I'll probably, maybe I'll even drink that more than I used to drink craft beer. Um, but and I really love the science behind it, you know, training all of our employees. Now I train our new employees. Um, we, you know, are always hiring, being the service industry, uh, no experiences needed, you know, cause I, Again, never worked as a bartender before. Now I'm our head bartender. Um, but yeah, I will help now. Not 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 as much as Michelle helps, but in designing the new menus. And so we have a new menu set for coming out in the spring. It'll be ha- we'll have some of our old cocktails in our last menu and some new additions. So a lot of exciting things planned. But um, yeah, so. We were all, a lot, a lot, a lot of us were just trained and, and never had bartending experience. For you, Josh, I mean, this is a lot new experiences, a lot of new stuff going on, making cocktails, running a, you know, cocktail distillery, a, a local craft bar. Um, what are some of those aha moments you've had to say, yeah, I'm on to something. This is working. What are some of those aha moments for you? I'll drink, I'll really drink anything. But I really love when people come in and say, I don't like gin or I don't drink dark liquor. Um, and then we show them, we say, hey, you know, we'll give you a little taste. Uh, we'll, give you a, we'll give you a cocktail with these spirits in it. And I really do get a lot of enjoyment out of people switching over. I know a lot of people that don't like gin come in and they say, um, more often than not, they have the same experience. They were in college, they raided their parents' liquor cabinet, drank a bottle of Beef Eater or, Lund, uh, or yeah, Beef Eater or Tanqueray, woke up the next morning feeling awful, and so they've sworn out gin for the last 20 years of their life. And then, you know, they try our gin, and they really enjoy it. It's, um, you know, very floral-forward gin, but I'll get into that. Uh, but again, you know, I love switching over people, and, you know, co- co- cocktails are really beautiful thing because you know even if you don't just like the taste of the spirit you can make a beautiful cocktail that's super well-rounded tailored specifically to those spirits and you know again if someone doesn't like sipping on gin they'll possibly love a gin cocktail i love how you perfectly described my experience (laughs) of being introduced to gin however I think for Dawn and I, we're almost at that point where we can walk into a distillery or a cocktail bar and we're going to say, we love gin, yeah. right? We love gin. So more often than not, I think our conversation is we love gin. We love craft gin. We love the different flavor profiles of the gin. So I think our conversation now is, hey, talk to us about your gin and we can't wait to try, you know, what you're producing because we love all those different flavor profiles, as I said, all those nuances mm-hmm. to what you can make with gin now. So I think when you talk about changing people's perspective, that's for us what the craft spirits industry has done for us. It's flipped us as you've taken an opportunity to reintroduce something to somebody who says, I don't want that. I still have a recollection of that bad experience, not knowing my name when I woke up and, uh, you know, or where I was when I had that beef eaters or that tangere, <laughs> as you mentioned. So you set this up perfectly. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to try some of your expressions that Widow's Peak Distilling Company is producing, okay? Fantastic. Pardon the interruption. If you like what you hear, if you love what you're hearing, please share the podcast. Please take a screenshot of the podcast, post it on your social media, tag us, just to let everybody else know about Fermented Adventure, the podcast. We'd be grateful for your help to grow our podcast. We're back. 
And we were talking a little bit about what we're about to try, and my mouth is salivating. <laughs> I'm like drooling here. Dawn's dabbing with a uh, a towel. <laughs> so where do you want us to start? We have the vodka, the rye whiskey, and the botanical gin. You're our tour guide today, Josh. Where are you taking us? Yeah, um, I'll grab the wheel, and I'll say we can start off with our vodka, since that's the first spirit we produce. All right, let's do it. Great. So this is your vodka. What are you distilling your vodka from? What's your base grain or where is it derived from? So our base grain is, it is uh, made with corn. It's corn mash. And that is, we chose that to appeal to the American palate, the new American palate. Um, I know lots of American vodkas are made with corn. So that's what, our, that was our decision on that. Um, and you got to be careful with it. It is 90 proof as well. Uh, originally, it was 80 proof, but our distiller said that tasted too much like water. Um, and he said, you know, we got to compete with the big guys. So we got those are rookie numbers. We, we got to bump those up to 90. So it is um, distilled to 190 proof. And then that is distilled down uh, to 90 proof. And we take only the hearts. Um, and it is distilled seven plus times and we pump it through a charcoal filter as well to clean out any lingering oils any um, impurities in it and if it's not up to standards we either dispose of it or we cycle it back through or it becomes cleaning solvent or, or something it becomes right cleaning solvent. <laughs> i really appreciate how you just described the experience i was having nosing the vodka and you didn't even know because the first thing i got is like wow this nose is a little higher in proof than a lot of vodkas that we try because many are just in that 80, 84 proof wheelhouse. And this nose is a little more. You mentioned the charcoal filtration. Now, for some reason, my nose does pick up a little essence of smoky when I get that charcoal filtration, hmm. almost like a uh, toasted marshmallow that you leave on the fire too long. And I love those where you burn them and you create that uh, char on the outside and creamy goodness on the inside. I always say to the idea, and Dawn and I talk about this often, about the idea that vodka should not be odorless and tasteless. That you should still get something on the nose and something on the palate. And for this, I do get that sweetness of the corn. There's a little bit of grassiness in the corn that comes out to me and some vanilla notes yeah. that, come, that come out um, that, that I enjoy. With this, now you're dist where we are in Ambler, there's no distillation that goes on. Where does all the distillation happen? Yeah, so originally our plan was to distill here. Uh, I know the viewers can't see, but it is a uh, you know, small but very mighty tasting room. If you're driving in your car, he's pointing out the right window, the left window, the back window, <laughs> all the windows. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that was our plan at first, but... You know, it would be uh, it would be tough. Um, so we actually distill out in Peach Bottom in Lancaster County, and our distiller lives out in Lincoln University, so it's close to him. Uh, the rent is cheap. It's very quiet out there. Um, we rent from the Amish, and it's uh, yeah. Well, very, now very that they heard, space. the rent's getting going up. Now. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> um, but yeah, so. That's where we distill, and then we don't have a tasting room out there. Uh, in you know, in Ambler, this is our brick and mortar tasting room. Definitely have plans to grow, but so this is yeah where you can buy all of our bottles, taste all of our spirits, get some cocktails. I get so much viscosity. There's such a coating to the tongue with this that lingers, and again, unexpected to what. I saw from my nose or what my nose told me to try, I get that burnt, the, the, the charcoal notes, that burnt marshmallow thing that I love, uh, but it's sweet. And I also get a little bit of licorice. Do you, do you, or a star anise on this? Yeah, I think I, I can taste the anise a little bit. Yep. And it is very sweet, which I like. This is delicious. This is a wonderful vodka. Thank you. And I also put this in that category. If you just like vodka, this could be a nice sipping vodka. Yeah. You can get this straight. You could put a little ice cube in it if you want. Or 
it's a base for making some of those cocktails. What are some of the vodka cocktails that are on your menu right now? Or if you want to give somebody a sneak peek on what may be coming in the spring that the mad scientists behind the <laughs> bar have created. Yeah. Um, so right now, um, one of our most popular drinks is our Bee's Knees. Uh, Bee's Knees is originally um, made with gin um, to bring out the floral notes, but... We wanted to incorporate more vodka into our cocktails, so that is very popular. Our bee's knees, there's uh, citrus bitters, lemon, local honey, and then vodka that goes into that, and then with a little lemon twist. And then another one of our cocktails is our spiced and spicy. Um, so that's a very traditional cocktail again. Um, there's egg white in it, chipotle, cinnamon, hot pepper bitters, a lime, honey, and then our vodka. And so that is uh, if you if if uh, you like egg white cocktails, I'm I'm a I, if ever I go anywhere I see egg white cocktail on their menu, I'm getting it. It creates a uh, and, and don't don't just think of you know Rocky Balboa, you know slugging the egg yolks and punching a, a, a meat in the freezer. Um, it's it creates like a we, we can't do that in the back room. <laughs> I mean, we can if you want. Not with that cocktail without the egg. Yeah, and you can do that. <laughs> that is actually, I'll tell you what, as you're describing it, I'm becoming more and more fascinated and interested and curious as to all those flavors coming together. I agree with you. I like the egg white. I like the creaminess that it creates, how it suspends some of those flavors on your tongue when you drink that. So, all right, I'm reserving one of those cocktails when we come back and the bar is open. I'll have one ready for you. I get... On that vodka, as again, as this, my mouth is becoming acclimated to that. I actually get some brininess, almost like a green peppercorn, because I get this spiciness mm. to that. And wonderful vodka. I can really, you know, I can really see where that distiller in Peach Bottom is dialed in on that seven plus uh, distillation process and the filtration, really great. And some of that uh, Amish corn that they're making out that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Should we do the gin or should we do the rye whiskey? What do you want to do? Um, this will go to the rye whiskey. All right, let's do some rye whiskey. You know, Josh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, as somebody here that works in the cocktail bar, how do you describe that vodka? I mean, what are some of your tasting notes? Yeah, I would say it's very clean and crisp vodka. Um, it, again, being with, made with corn, it has a very corn uh, finish and peppery after, uh, peppery um, finish as well. We're moving on to this rye whiskey. And look, I mean, here's what we know in the craft world. People will walk in and they see your white, your clear spirits. And most of the time, if you get those bourbon, those whiskey, those rye, those single malt people, they'll come in and say, what do you got for brown spirits, right? And as you pointed out, you're only really, as you've been distilling, less than two years old. So we understand that bourbon and whiskey and rye, they take time. They take time to flavor and mature and age. Now, we know it says on the bottle, distilled in Indiana. So we talked off podcast, MGP is providing your rye whiskey. Is there or are there barrels resting currently in Peach Bottle? Yeah, yeah, there are. There are currently. Um uh, uh, yeah, it is a right, currently it is a proprietary special blend that we partnered with MGP Ingredients down in Indiana to um, yeah make our rye whiskey. Um, the rye whiskey is four plus years aged, single malt in single barrels, um, and it is forty five percent corn, fifty percent rye, and five percent malted barley. Um, so it's it's higher corn percentage than a regular rye which gives it a little less spice, a little less of a kick. Um, very mellow and sweet. Uh, it's great for rye cocktails and bourbon the like. Um, and yeah, it's, we like to say it sips like a bourbon. And now, of what you're distilling in Peach Bottom now, are there runs of whiskey being done in barrel there, or is everything still the plan to bring stuff in from MGP? Yeah, we definitely in the next few years, um, if we want to, you know, make our own rye whiskey, um, but it's uh, a step that we have to take. I know with all new distilleries, um, I've learned that usually more than not, people, most distilleries do buy it two years aged. Um, 
and then so they just can get their feet on the ground. Um, but you know, we love this stuff. And um, if I go home with an employee bottle, I'm going home with a rye. <laughs> well, all right. Before I delve in, as you explain this to your customer, talk about your tasting notes, the experience that you're communicating from the rye when people come in to Widow's Peak. Yeah. So I like, um, I'd say I love hearing customers' experience. The customers like, you know, palate notes, what they smell. I know some of our regulars have said uh, they get notes of chocolate, toasted marshmallow, um, you know, certain types of uh, wood. Myself, I um, get just very sweet, subtle notes, and um, it, it, it's not when you when you sip it as well. I just imagine, you know, when I go home, a couple drops of water in it, drinking it neat. Sitting right by the fire. <laughs> As you're expressing that, and I love that because, you know, here's what I find. As you really pointed out, look, it's 50 rye, 45 corn, right? And then you got the malted barley, take care of those enzymes, maybe impart a little smokiness. On the nose, it's this balance of sweet and a little grassy and oaky. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just this almost as I always point out, like the conductor at an orchestra. And everybody's all really playing together. There's nothing there that steps forward to me that says, in a lot of rise, you'll find that punch of the the grassy notes and, you know, in some cases, the spiciness of it, baking spices. On a bourbon, you're going to get the sweetness of the corn. And if it's, 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 you know, a bourbon with some rye into it, you know, I, I find that with this, it's a nice harmony of things together on the nose. Corn, rye, oakiness, and then they just keep blending back and forth. So I love the I, I, by a fire, just sitting here at the at the bar here, just talking to people. Just keep you know. I, this is something I can nose and not even put to my lips, probably for a good half hour, yeah. just to and and allow this to open up and allow my nose to become acclimated to everything. The oils that are just everything that's in this, as it just you know. Th- allows for this adventure. This is fun. I love it. Unlike your vodka, I was expecting this to be more viscous, a little bit thicker on the palate. I find it to be thinner, which allows, you know, right away that sweetness of the corn comes in. And what lingers for me really quickly is the oak. I get a lot of tannin that just stays with me. There was a point there, I don't know if you got it, where vanilla just blew vanilla up. Vanilla and maple. Mm. Right? It just blew maple. up. That's really That cool. was so cool. Yeah. Right on the right on the, the, the tongue. So forward, around the sides, on that first, that, that second sip, what I get is, um, you know, cherry, and um, I, I get the ethanol is a little bit more on that second sip as, as my mouth becomes again acclimated to this. There's, there's that smokiness that lingers now and that's fun. That's fun. That's good. I like that. Wow. What like mad scientists you guys are in <laughs> peach bottom. I love it. Oh, I know. <laughs> now there's a gin in our future. Let's try some gin. Let's try some gin. Now, Josh, I know you put nuts on the table. But we haven't had any yet. These are the fancy nuts that you serve, the really important customers. And um, thank you for putting those out for us at Fermented Adventure. But one of the things that I, you know, as I continue to sip this rye, it, it, became, it, it became nutty to me um, a little bit. So, uh, you know, with this, as I said, I think you could really nose this for a half an hour and just take a nice pour of this and just sip this and just allow this to meander to some different flavors Take your time with whiskey because you're going to be so surprised with the experience you're going to have versus, you know, taking a couple gulps and it's done and move on to the next thing. Mm. This is really a nice storytelling rye. Really enjoy that. Thank you. Yeah. And if uh, should try our old fashioned next time you come in as well. We've got this white, egg white <laughs> cocktail and old, like just set them up for us, Josh. Well, I, I can do. <laughs> Yeah, or old fat. We have two types of old fashions at the moment, um, uh, it, and it's our own variations as well. Just like any other bar, um, our old fashioned has aromatic bitters in it, amaretto cherry syrup, rye, 
and then uh, lemon twist. And the lemon twist really accentuates well with the cherry syrup. Um, and then, you know, some people will, some people will get it. I, not, not, not very often. And they'll say, why is this old fashioned red? <laughs> and I'll be like, well, you know, again, the old fashioned is many colors any, uh, um, and have any ingredients that you want to put in it. It's just, you know, bitters, sugar, alcohol. That's good. We're on the gin. Talk about, by the way, I forgot to ask. What's the proof on the rye whiskey? Oh, yes. The rye whiskey is 90 proof. 90 proof. And I will tell you, that really comes in at a 90. It, mm. there's, there's not a lot of burn. There's not a lot of ethanol. And I think that's, again, what allows that rye, that corn, that malted barley mash bill to stand up and allow their flavors to come through. So mm. that was the other thing that um, I'm glad you shared that and, and mentioned the proof on that. What's the proof on the gin that we're trying? The gin is a little bit smaller. The gin is 86 proof. Okay. Um, so our gin is a wheat mash base. Uh, we like to say it's not your grandfather's gin. You know, there's nothing against people liking piney gin, but that was not our plan. Um, we didn't want, you know, to be taken by the Christmas tree, get the mouthful of pine needles. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's a very new age off dry type of gin. Um, and again, like I said before, people... I've been coming in here really enjoying it. People that don't even like gin have really uh, coming in and have been enjoying it. Um, so it has uh, your classic botanicals like juniper, coriander, very light in juniper as to not get the piney notes. Um, it has orris root, angelica root, cardamom, citrus peel, and then licorice root as well. One of the things that we've learned about gin and the different botanicals is that they don't always have to be flavor forward. That what they do is they accent another botanical or they come together and create a flavor profile that you wouldn't have gotten out of just one of those alone. Mm -hmm. On the nose, it's very floral to me. It's almost like walking through a lavender field. And it's a very light... It's, it's almost like... It's the morning and there's this wind coming off a flower field and you get that on the yeah. nose. I, I don't get a lot of, 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 the, of the citrus that comes through. I just get this wonderful floral that I just, again, I just want to kind of go run through this field <laughs> that, that you're creating here. On the mouth field and the mouth, and I just drank all yours. I'm sorry, Don. There's this wonderful, in, in the back of the mouth, it, it almost, it's, it's almost like the consistency of eating a caramel or a caramel, hmm. however you do that, where it, it forms this wonderful, I, I can't, exp I, I don't want to say gumminess to it because I don't want to sound disparaging because that's not what I experienced, but it almost comes together and it rests on the back of the mouth before you swallow. And when you do that, you release all those oils. You get the citrus. You get the spices. I get the cardamom. Um, I wish I could tell you what angelica root tastes like, but I can't, so I don't know. <laughs> but you get all these things that as the, as the gin goes down, you get these flavors that come back towards the mouth. And that's three expressions that Widow's Peak is presenting. Three expressions that Widow's Peak is producing, and they're all so much fun. That's a good sipping gin. That's a great mm -hmm. sipping gin. That's very nice. Yeah. So talk about, right, so you said you make a bee's knees out of vodka. What are your cocktails out of gin? Yeah, so our cocktails out of gin right now, we have our sparkling personality. Um, and, you know, it we we want to talk cocktails, not you, Josh. Okay. <laughs> it may or may not be named after myself, but... <laughs> Um, may not look it, but I do bubbly personality. Um, but so that is our, um, so it's gin, blackberries, rosemary, lemon, simple syrup. And then we muddle all of that up together. Uh, and we top it with, um, it's currently 1723 sparkling rosé. And then we garnish it with a little, um, rosemary. Um, it's very, very, very sweet and very tasty. Um, one, one of my favorite cocktails. Uh, and then we have our freshly picked, which is cinnamon, ginger, um, apple, local apple cider, honey, um, 
and then Aramac bitters and uh, garnished with a little slice of candy ginger. And that has been very popular this season. That's going to be my popular one. Yeah, people, I, I, people ask me uh, how, how I describe it, and I just say, imagine frolicking through some local apple orchard, you know, taking some cute pictures, hanging up in ladders, picking apples, <laughs> just having a great fall day. What can people expect when they come here to the cocktail bar? Do you have live music right now? Do you have a back area that opens up? during the warmer weather what what's the experience that people can expect besides these great cocktails that they can anticipate yeah so we have we try and have live music every week if not every other week either friday or saturday um and then actually i'm glad you asked that because next uh come come this summer we are going to lay ground when it will be finished to a back patio so we can fit around uh max 50 people in here sit around 43 uh, and the back space will be able to at least double our tasting room. So we're going to concrete it over. Right now, it's just an alley, not something, you know, not very nice to look at. But two or back doors, the accordion swing open. And so we're going to yeah, concrete it over, brick it over. We'll have a back bar, a fireplace, a TV. Um, and then we'll, right now, we don't currently have bars. And Emeril Lagasse will be hosting as a guest chef back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spicing it up. Bam. I, I, I don't know why. I just pictured that in the back. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And then we've been tossing around the idea as well for getting a food truck trailer and um, providing brunch. But again, we're just tossing that idea around at the moment. Um, but we're, we're very excited. And uh, back, the, um, you know, the back alley patio is happening and we there's nothing like that in ambler um it'll be great because it'll be it'll be walled in um and it's yeah again there's gonna be bar seating currently in our tasting room we don't have any bar seating you can stand at the bar but that was just to encourage the experience um you know we're uh again 1920 speakeasy cocktail bar so the cocktails take a little bit longer than a normal bar to get out to you, but it's a certain order of, opera order of operations we follow um, where you get the drinks out consistent, um, as uh, consistent every time and delicious as possible. Um, and you now we're at the distillery. So it is our spirits that are going into all the cocktails and we want, um, you know, just to provide the best tasting cocktails as possible every single time. How do people, find you what's your address are you on the socials what's your social media handle website give us the whole rundown of uh the interwebs and how people can uh, find you yeah so we our address is 10 east butler avenue in ambler pennsylvania located right downtown in the heart of ambler um we're uh located right next to the train station as well so it's the doylestown lansdale train if you're coming from philly it's just a short a train ride away Get a lot of great breweries along the way. Um, but so we are on Facebook and Instagram right now um, at Widow's Peak Distilling. Um, and then you can also find us on our website. Uh, we take reservations and walk-ins. Um, so you can make reservations on our website or give us a call. Or, again, just feel free to walk in. and We'd love to seat you down. But we just want that mix of, say, we try and just have larger parties have reservations. Um some people prefer reservations. Some people, you know, prefer walk-ins. So we want just to have that good mix of both. You mentioned, hey, you can take a train from Doylestown. You can take a train from Philly. You're really 40 minutes north of Philadelphia. You're 10, 15 minutes off the Blue Route, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. You're not that far from 309. So Ambler is accessible to a lot of places if you're either just passing through or you want to make this uh, a, a nice Saturday or Sunday or a Friday night. There's a lot to do here. You just listed, you know, 18 cocktails or so, or at <laughs> least I, I kept thinking more cocktails were coming. So there's a lot to enjoy here. Drink your spirits neat. Get the flight. Try the cocktails. Josh, is there anything that we haven't talked about on the podcast? Anything you want to share about Widow's Peak yourself and let our listeners know about? So, yeah, I guess I'll mention, you know, challenges of starting a new distillery. Um, you know, like every new business, we're trying to find our niche. This is a whole new rodeo to myself, our owners, and our vice president. So just learning as we go. Um, and, yeah, whether that be wholesale, distribution, um, 
you know, just selling it in our tasting room. But definitely we have plans in the future to open up um, a second tasting room. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing because, uh, well, if, if listeners are familiar with Pennsylvania liquor laws, they're uh, very, very wacky. I know um, before I turned 21, or right when I turned 21, I remember you could only buy beer specifically at a beer distributor. You can only buy wine and liquor specifically at a state store. But, you know, the laws have loosened up where you can buy, you know, wine and beer now in grocery stores, which is great. Um, so there is currently a law on the Senate floor um, that, that um, you know, we hope to pass that will allow liquor sales in grocery stores. But again, you know, PA laws are very crazy, but we definitely want to um, be on the front end of that with distilleries. Uh, canning, we have tossed that around. Um, possibly canning cocktails in the future. Um, you know, we're always we're, we're always interested in what else we can do. Um, <clears throat> and again, since this is just craft distilleries, is kind of a new business. Uh, opening up, there are also sometimes you know aren't laws. And just craft distilleries are just plowing, pl- are just blazing the way, um, and then they need to create new laws because we're expanding so quickly, uh, which is great. And again, it's just a very collaborative community. Um, we're just all trying to help each other out. It's you know, look, you're you're blazing a path. And every day is a new day. You have new challenges. Um, rate your congressman, local state representative. Pass these laws so, you know, places like Widow's Peak can have more of an access to the consumer. Because right now, you know, getting into the Pennsylvania liquor store system is very difficult. They require a large commitment from you as a distiller. And you still have to have bottles available for your walkout customers. Mm -hmm. You still have bottles available for your cocktails. Um, so, you know, a, a young startup like you are, growing as you are, there, there are those hurdles to overcome. And the more – it's like that, you know, it's, it's not a cliche. It's a slogan, support your local business. But the more we see these craft distilleries like yourselves grow and flourish, the more we as consumers get to benefit by these delicious craft items, these craft spirits that you're making, we win. Everybody wins. Mm. And, you know, today there are challenges. Tomorrow you'll have even more challenges. Um, But this has been a treat for Dawn and I. This has been awesome. Um, Ambler, Pennsylvania, you've got to come check out Widow's Peak Distilling Company. Stay for the cocktails. Check out their website for the live music. And uh, we want to thank you, Josh, for your time, for being a friend of Fermented Adventure. And we will be back for cocktails. Uh, we're we're going to do other, a, a new segment, sitting down at the bar with cocktails with Josh. And uh, that'll, be, that'll be a whole different four-hour endeavor where we just make cocktails and drink cocktails. What do you think? That sounds great. <laughs> Josh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers.